All right, good morning. Time for us to go ahead and begin this morning. Happy Father's Day to every father out there this morning. What a good leader of God that we have the opportunity to study on this Father's Day. Um, we're going to be in Joshua's uh, chapters 12 through 15, so we're going to kind of move through some of this relatively quickly. Um, but we'll slow down through here in different parts and highlight some things as well. I do want to pick up reading just at the end of chapter 11 uh, before we get into chapter 12, though. Starting in uh, <clears throat> chapter 11, verse 21, And Joshua came at that time and cut off the Anakim, that would be the giants, from the hill country, from Hebron, from Deber, from Anab, and from the hill country of Judah, and from the hill country of Israel. Joshua devoted them to destruction with their cities. There was none of the Anakim left in the land of, uh, of the people of Israel, only in Gaza, in Gath, and Ashdod did some remain. So Joshua took the whole land according to all that the Lord had spoken to Moses, and Joshua gave it for an inheritance to Israel according to their tribal allotments, and the land had rest from war. There's that idea. We talked about rest from battle at the very beginning beginning of this study in week one, that this is one of the themes that you see a few times throughout the book, that when Israel obeyed God, they conquered the land, God did what? He provided rest. And so we see that here at the end of chapter 11, once they had conquered this land. Alright, chapter 12. Now these are the kings of the land whom the people of Israel defeated and took possession of their land beyond the Jordan toward the sunrise. That would be where? East of the Jordan. Who conquered the land east of the Jordan? Moses and Israel. From the sunrise from the valley of the Arnon to Mount Hermon with all the Arabah eastward, Sihon, king of the Amorites, who lived at Heshbon and ruled from Aurora, which is on the edge of the valley of Armon, and from the middle of the valley as far as the river Jabbok to the boundary of the Ammonites, that is, half of Gilead and the Arabah to the Sea of Chinaroth. What's the Sea of Chinaroth? We would know it as the Sea of Galilee. Okay. Eastward in the direction of Beth something, I'm not going to entertain you with trying to pronounce that, to the Sea of Arabah, to the Salt Sea, southward to the foot of the slopes of Pisgah. And Og, king of Bashan, one of the remnant of the Rephraim, who lived in Ashtaroth, and Idri, the, and ruled over Mount Hermon, and Seleka, and Bashan to the boundary of the Geshurites, and the Machites, and over the Gilead to the boundary of Sihon, king of Heshbon. Moses, the servant of the Lord, there's that phrase that is applied to Moses most often, servant of the Lord, and the people of Israel defeated them, and Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave their land for a possession to the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. So these first six verses are a summary of the land that was conquered by Moses and Israel east of the Jordan before they crossed over the Jordan into the land of Canaan. And so this land was going to be provided for uh, Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh upon their request. You remember we talked about that in the first week or so, that they had... Notice this land, it looked uh, appealing for their livestock and all these different things. And so they asked Moses, can we live here? And what did he say? Yes, on one condition, what? You come over the Jordan with us and fight for the rest, with the rest of your brethren. And once this land is conquered, then you can come back. So these first six verses, just a summary, an outline. They're given the boundaries of the land that will be inhabited by these two and a half tribes. Okay. Now, picking up in verse 7. And these are the kings of the land whom Joshua and the people of Israel defeated on the west side of the Jordan. Okay, Now I'm not, again, going to try to show you my lack of pronunciation skills by trying to read all these different names. But starting in verse 7 and going through the end of this chapter 12 is a summary of the rest of the conquered uh, land that was conquered once Joshua led Israel over the Jordan onto, the, onto Canaan. Okay? Now there's 31 kings listed here, okay? 31 kings that Joshua and Israel defeated, of course, by the Lord being on their side. Now, I have a question for you. In your at-home Bible study, when you have your own personal Bible study time and you're reading through, let's say that you're reading through the book of Joshua, 
and you get to chapter 12, do you skip over it or do you read it? Okay? Yeah, I mean, we read it, but okay, let's say we read it. What's the purpose of this chapter? It's a summary of what has been conquered, right? That's what it is. From verse 1 all the way through verse 24 is a summary of the land that has been conquered by God through Israel. You know, I, I struggle sometimes with, with chapters like this and really with chapters that are coming up. You know, some of these chapters, uh, you look at them and we're about to get into the, the individual uh, descriptions of each land that is provided to each tribe and all these different things. And I think we need to remember, number one, God keeps His promises. As we go through these chapters, remember, this is a fulfillment of what God promised all the way back starting in Genesis chapter 12 to Abraham. Okay, Now, also with this chapter, this is a history lesson, isn't it? This is something that Israel was able to look back on and see this is what God has done. I think there's a principle there that for you and I that we need to, to appreciate. God wants us to always remember what He has done. I find it interesting when you read through the Pentateuch, well really not Genesis, but when you read through Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, you're going to see at least 12 times the Lord says this, I am the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. Why is He doing that? Why does He say that? He wants them to remember what He has done for them. Interestingly enough, most often he says, I am the Lord who brought you out of Egypt when he is about to give them an instruction or a law. I am the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, so this is what you need to do. Remember what I have done for you. Now, on the other side of the coin, turn over to Judges chapter 8. We're going to get into Judges here in the next month, hopefully, if everything works out the way we plan on it to. And we'll see, of course, the cycle that Israel goes through that we've all, we've all studied some. But I want us to see this. Starting in verse 33, As soon as Gideon died, the people of Israel turned again and whored after the Baals and made Baal Bereth their God. Look at verse 34. And the people of Israel did not remember the Lord their God who delivered them from the hand of all their enemies on every side. What happened with Israel? They forgot. They didn't remember God. They didn't remember what he, what he had done. They didn't remember His power. They didn't remember what all He accomplished through them in conquering their enemies. All these different things. Now, you bring that home to us today. Here in just a few moments, we're going to partake of the Lord's Supper. And Jesus says what? Do this what? In remembrance of me couple of things I want us to think about. Number one, when we are partaking that, I hope we truly do focus on what God and Christ has done for us. But number two, I hope that's not the only time during the week that we think about that. We need to remember what God has done for us every single day. I think God wanted to leave things like this recorded so that Israel could look back and see what God had done for them. And, and it's a principle that we need to hold on to, that we need to remember what God has done for us. Alright, let's uh, pick up reading, look at ver uh, chapter 13. Will you change that slide? I don't think this is working anymore. Now Joshua was old and advanced in years, and the Lord said to him, you are old and advanced in years, and there remains yet very much land to possess. The Lord's kind of straightforward, isn't He? <laughs> Joshua, you're old. I couldn't get away with saying that to some people, could I? The Lord did. You are old and advanced in years, uh, and there remains yet very much land to possess. This is the land that remains all the regions of the Philistines and all the, uh, those of the Geshurites from Sihor, which is east of Egypt, northward to the boundary of Ekron. It is counted as Canaanite. There are five rulers of the Philistines, those of Gaza, Ashdod, um, Ash Ashkelon, Gath, and Ekron, and those of the Avim. 
in the south, all the land of the Canaanites and the Marah that belongs to the Sidonians, to Aphek, to the boundary of the Amorites, uh, and the land of the Gebelites, and all of Lebanon toward the sunrise, from Baal God below Mount Hermon to Lebo Hamath, all the inhabitants of the hill country from Lebanon to Mishparoth, uh, even all the Sidonians. I myself will drive them out from before the people of Israel. Only allot the land to Israel for an inheritance as I have commanded you. Now therefore divide this land for an inheritance to the nine tribes and half the tribe of Manasseh. So, these first seven verses in chapter 13, God tells Joshua, hey man, you're getting on up. But we still got work to do. Okay? Um, there is still land that needs to be conquered, number one, but now is the time that I want you to go ahead and start dividing up the land. Remember, God had already provided rest in the land, hasn't He? Even though there's still some land that needs to be conquered, God has provided rest. Now, it seems to me what is expected by God is that Joshua is going to divide up the inheritance to the rest of the nine and a half tribes that are left to be have their inheritance given to them. And it is expected of them when they go to that land to continue to drive out the rest of the inhabitants of the land. And now you notice, what was one group that's left to be driven out? One that we will read about later on. The Philistines. They gave Israel some headaches, didn't they? So what do I know already? Israel did not fulfill their end of the bargain. And we'll see that, of course, more than one time. Um, <clears throat> so, God is telling Joshua that I need you to divide up the land among the rest of the tribes to receive their inheritance. What I want us to appreciate is, number one, God never expects His servants to retire. Joshua's old. He's lived a difficult life. He's been in battle after battle. He's continued to live God, uh, live faithfully to God, but yet God says there's still work I need you to do. I worry too many times as we grow older, we have the idea, well, I've had my time. I've done my part. Now it's time for these other younger ones to... Nowhere in Scripture do we read of that principle. Joshua's old. He's had a difficult life. God still expects him to do what he asked. There is never a retirement ceremony in Scripture. And so we need to remember that. That there is still, yes, life gets more difficult. The book of Ecclesiastes teaches that. We see that from experience. But God still expects all of us to continue to do everything that we can to serve Him. Now, I want us to look at verse 6, okay? All of the inhabitants of the hill country from Lebanon to Mishmaroth, Maim, even the Sidonians, I myself, who's speaking here? God. He says, I myself will drive them out from before the people of Israel. Do all the inhabitants of the land of Canaan get driven out? Yes or no? No. We just talked about that and we'll continue to see that. Now, what happened then? This is not an exception to the rule. We have talked about this multiple times throughout this study that when God gives a promise, it's always with a condition, isn't it? This is not an exception. He still expects for Israel to do what He asks. If they do that, He will drive the inhabitants of the land out. If they do not, He will not drive them out. That's right. Yeah. That's right. That's one of the, Mom was saying, that's one of the lessons that we learned during our vacation Bible school with, in respect to Noah. God asked Noah to do X, Y, and Z. And if he does, then God will save them. If Noah did not do that, then what? 
God's not going to fulfill His end of the bargain. Yes, sir. You can't hear me? I think I'm about as loud as I can go. Can I go up anymore? Right here. We'll see. I'll try to talk louder. Um, so, we see that this, is, again, is not an exception to the rule that God always, when He promises, there's always conditions. I have a quote for you up there on the screen. This is from, uh, under letter C, this is from the Kaufman Commentaries. I think it summed it up very well. It said, God never unconditionally promised to put Israel in possession of Canaan. The promise of their possessing it was dependent on their fidelity to God. If we want to see, receive our promised land, it's not met without conditions, is it? We're not going to receive that without conditions. And so, we see here that God said, yes, I will drive them out, but of course, underlying that principle is what? You have to meet the conditions, okay? Oh, absolutely. As long as the conditions were met, right? As long as the conditions were met. All right, uh, starting in verse 8 of chapter 13, <clears throat> going through the end of that chapter, um, this would have been the land east of the Jordan that is divided uh, as Moses had instructed. This would be the detailed description in these verses of the land that is provided for uh, Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. This is just given the boundaries and all these specifications in these verses, okay? I'm certainly not going to try to read all of this. Um, I do want us to highlight just a few things though. Look at chapter 13, verse 14. To the tribe of Levi alone, Moses gave no inheritance. The offerings by, the, uh, by fire to the Lord God of Israel are their inheritance as He said to them. Now go over to... Uh, verse 33, the end of the chapter, but to the tribe of Levi, Moses gave no inheritance. The Lord God of Israel is their inheritance, just as He said to them. Now, I want us to skip forward into chapter 14. This is the same type of idea. Verses 3 through 4, for Moses had given an inheritance to the two and one half tribes beyond the Jordan, that'd be east of the Jordan, but to the Levites he gave no inheritance among them. For the people of Joseph were two tribes, Manasseh and Ephraim, and no portion was given to the Levites in the land, but only cities to dwell in with their pasture lands for their livestock and their substance. So we see that Levi was not provided an inheritance of land in the land of Canaan. Okay, Now, why is that? I want us to look... Sir... Yeah, they were, the, they were designated as the priestly tribe, which meant what? It was their responsibility to serve in the tabernacle and later on in the temple, right? That was what Levi, their responsibility was. Now, look over into Numbers chapter 18. This will be when uh, this type of idea is established. Look at verse 21. To the Levites, I have given every tribe in Israel for an inheritance in return for their service that they do, their service in the tent of meeting, that would be the tabernacle, so that the people of Israel do not come near the tent of meeting, lest they bear uh, sin and die. But the Levites shall do the service to the tent of the meeting, and they shall bear their iniquity. It shall be a perpetual statute throughout your generations and among the people of Israel. They shall have no inheritance. For the tithe of the people of Israel, which they present as a contribution to the Lord, I have given to the Levites for an inheritance. Therefore, I have said of them that they shall have no inheritance among the people of Israel. So they were not going to receive a physical land inheritance. What was their inheritance? In Joshua, we read it as, the, uh, as what? The offerings by fire to the Lord God of Israel are their inheritance, and then in verse 33, the Lord God of Israel is their inheritance. In Numbers, we see how that actually will take place. When the people of Israel came before and, and gave their tithe to God, who was able to use that? The Levites were. That's how they were going to be taken care of. And not only that, we, we will see as we go through that, 
the Levites were allowed to live in the cities among, uh, amongst the different um, tribes in their, in their allotment of the, of the land. And also, whenever a sacrifice was made, certain portions of that sacrifice was designated for the consumption of the Levites. Okay? Now, from a human perspective, this seems almost unfair. Just on the surface, doesn't it? All my other brothers, they're getting all this land, aren't they? What about me? One thing I want us to appreciate is that God will always, always take care of His servants. Always. When you get over to Matthew chapter 6 and the Sermon on the Mount, God says what? Why are you worrying? Don't worry. I'm taking care of the birds of the air. Taking care of the fields. How much more am I going to take care of you? God is always going to take care of His servants. And here I think we see an example of that. Levi was set apart. They had a special responsibility to serve God. And that was their responsibility. And that, was, in a sense, was their inheritance. Okay? But God still was not going to let them go not, and be not taken care of. Okay? I think that's important for us to see. Yeah? Yeah? That's right. Yeah? Uh, Mom brings up a good point that maybe uh, uh, another lesson for us is that God was wanting Levi to really focus on the spiritual aspect of things and not have to be concerned with the physical uh, uh, things in in this life. So that's a good lesson too. All right, chapter 14, I'm going to slow down just a little bit here. We're going to come across this man named Caleb. Now who was Caleb? The other faithful spy. So when... When Israel came to the border of Canaan at first, we talked about this early on in our study, Uh, Moses sent in 12 spies, one from each tribe, right? They went in, they spied out the lands for what, 40 days, if if I remember right? They came back, 10 of them were what? Scared to death. What did they say? We can't do it. We can't conquer this land. There's giants in the land. We look like grasshoppers compared to them. But then you have Joshua and Caleb. And what did they say? Oh, we got this. God is on our side. We can do this. And so, chapter 14, we're going to be reintroduced to this man, Caleb. He is a person that I really wish I knew more about. I wish there was more in Scripture about this person. But we're going to to spend just a little time talking about him with the information we are provided. Alright, verse 1. These are the inheritance that the people of Israel received <coughs> in the land of Canaan, which Eleazar, priest and, uh, Eleazar the priest and Joshua the son of Nun, and the heads of the fathers of the houses of the tribes of the people of Israel gave them to inherit. Their inheritance was by lot, just as the Lord had commanded by the hand of Moses for the nine and one half tribes. That seems interesting to you and I. That something this, of this magnitude, would be, in, in my eyes, almost left up to chance. Well, it's not by chance. A lot was not by chance. Proverbs 16 makes it clear who was really in control of that decision. God is. And so this was just God's way of, of splitting up the land among the different people. Okay, Israel knew this was God's decision. Okay, Verse 3, for Moses had given an inheritance to the two and one half tribes beyond the Jordan, that's east of the Jordan, but to the Levites he gave no inheritance among them. For the people of Joseph were two tribes, Manasseh and Ephraim, and no portion was given to the Levites in the land, but only cities to dwell in with their pasture lands for their livestock and their inheritance. We already talked about that. The people of Israel did as the Lord commanded Moses, they allotted the land. Verse 6, then the people of Judah came to Joshua at Gilgal. And Caleb, the son of Jephthah and the Kezite, said to him, You know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God in Kadesh Barnea, concerning you and me. Alright, hold on right there. Let's turn back to uh, Numbers chapter 14. This is after what we just described. When the, the 12 tribes were sent in, the 10 came back with the, with the faithless response. And then you had Joshua and Caleb give the faithful response. 
Uh, Numbers 14, uh, starting in verse 20. Let's start in verse 20. Then the Lord said, I have pardoned according to your word, but truly, as I live, and as all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord, none of the men who have seen my glory and my signs that I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and, uh, and yet have put me to the test these ten times and have not obeyed my voice. What did God just say? They didn't remember what I did in Egypt. These ten, they came back and they forgot. They, they weren't focused on what I had already done. They were focused on these supposed giants, right, that they couldn't conquer. They had forgotten what God had done in Egypt already. Verse 23, shall see the land that I swore to give to their fathers, and none of those <coughs> who despised me shall see it. That's interesting. God viewed their rebellion and their faithlessness as a despisement. Verse 24, But my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit and has followed me fully, I bring into the land into uh, which he went and his descendants shall possess it. But Caleb, the one who is a different spirit, a different heart, one who has followed me wholly, or fully, I will bring him into the land. Now, go to Deuteronomy. This is uh, basically a repeat of the same thing that we just read. Deuteronomy ch uh, chapter 1, verse 35, Not one of these men of this evil generation shall, shall see the good land that I swore to give to your fathers, except Caleb, the son of Jephunneh. He shall see it, and to him and to his children I will give the land on which he has trodden, because he has wholly followed the Lord. Back to Joshua chapter 14, verse 7. I was forty years old when Moses the servant of the Lord sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out to the land, and I brought him word again as it was in my heart. So he was forty the first time they came to the edge of Canaan. When he was sent in as a spy, he was 40 years old. Okay, But my brothers who went up with me made the heart of the people melt. Yet I wholly follow the Lord my God. That is the third time we have seen a description of Caleb as being fully or wholly, completely faithful to God. From start to finish, he was faithful. Verse 9, And Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land on which your foot has trodden shall be an inheritance for you and your children forever, because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. And now, behold, the Lord has kept me alive, just as He said these 45 years since that time that the Lord spoke this word of Moses while Israel walked in the wilderness. So, he was 40 at the time they went in, spied out the land of Canaan. It's been 45 years since then. How old would he be? 85. He answers that for us here in just a minute. Uh, and now, behold, I am this day 85 years old. So it's been 45 years. Let me see if we can do our math right. It's been 45 years since Moses sent in the first set of spies to spy out the land. How long did they wander in the wilderness? About 38 years. So you subtract 45 minus 38. How many years did it take them to conquer from Joshua 1 to really through Joshua 12? The conquering took about seven years. About seven years, right? Okay. So that's how we come up with that seven year number, okay, from what Caleb describes here. And now, behold, I am this day 85 years old. I am still as strong today as I was in the day that Moses sent me. My strength now is as my strength was then, for war and for going and for coming. Now, so now, give me this hill country of which the Lord spoke on that day. For you heard on that day how the Anakim were there with great fortified cities. It may be that the Lord will be uh, with me, and I shall drive them out just as the Lord said. I really wish we had more details about Caleb's life. 
four or five times we've read already that he is described as wholly following the Lord. Completely. From beginning to end. He was faithful. Now, what did you notice that Caleb described here? I think we see a couple of things that we need to appreciate. Number one, he says, I am still as strong today as I was back when I was 40. And who does he give credit to? God. Caleb knew his strength came from where? From God. Listen to what he says later on. So now give me this hill country or mountain of which the Lord spoke on that day. For you heard on that day how the Anakim, that's the giants, were there with great fortified cities. It may be that the Lord will be with me and I shall drive them out just as the Lord said. Caleb knew what? He knew the very same thing that day that he knew 45 years earlier when he was 40 years old. If God is with me, I can do it. I can do it. It doesn't matter if I have giants to conquer. It doesn't matter if they're on a mountain I can do it because God gives me strength. There's something we need to apply to ourselves. We can conquer any mountain in life with God. Can't we? There's not going to be a situation in life that we can't conquer as long as God is on our side. Caleb knew that. Now, interestingly enough, by the time you get over to chapter 15 here in just a moment, we're going to see that he indeed, indeed did do what he said he would be able to do with God on his side. And we'll read about that here in just a moment. Another thing I want us to appreciate about Caleb. As far as I can tell, he was not born a Jew. When you trace his family tree back, it, he comes from the Edomites, which would have been Esau. You had Jacob and Esau. Jacob would become Israel, right? Esau was his brother. Caleb's family came from Esau, from the best that I can tell. Now this is a principle, this is an example of a principle that we see, of course, taught later on. It is those who are faithful to God that He will bring into His family. Look at Galatians. Oh, let's see. Galatians chapter 3, verse 23. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law and prison until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. You see, to the Jew it was what? It was a... Uh, a wonderful thing to be able to say, we're from Abraham, right? I'm from Abraham. Father Abraham. Now you get over into the New Testament though, and we see that it is those that are faith, of faith. If we are in Christ, then we are heirs according to the promise of Abraham. That promise made all the way back in Genesis chapter 12. And so Caleb is a good example, even under the old law, that God wanted those people that would be faithful and loving Him. He's not the only one. We've already read about one in, in Joshua chapter 2. Rahab. Right? She was not born a Jew, was she? But she decided to be faithful to the one true God. Ruth is another example. There are several different examples of people throughout the Old Testament that they were not born phys of physical Israel but they were faithful to God. And so God basically adopted them into the family of Israel, if you will. And so we see this great man of faith, Caleb. He wasn't even born a Jew, but yet he wholly followed and was faithful to God. What a good, good example that he is to the rest of us. Alright, any thoughts or comments on that before we get into... 
the end of 14 and chapter 15. All right. Verse 13 of chapter 14. Then Joshua blessed him, and he gave Hebron to Caleb, the son of Jephthah, for an inheritance. Therefore Hebron became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephthah the Kenesite, to this day. Now, of course, as Mr. Gary has said, whenever to this day is when this was written, right? We don't know exactly when that was, but to this day is when this was written. Because he wholly followed the Lord, the God of Israel. Now the name of Hebron uh, formerly was Kiriath Arba. Arba was the great, greatest man among the Anakim, and the land had rest from war. There's that idea of rest from battle again. Chapter 15, <clears throat> the allotment for the tribe of the people of Judah according to their clans reached southward to the boundary of Edom to the wilderness of Zin to the farthest south. So in chapter 15 is when it begins that we start to see the individual tribes being set apart and their allotment of land being described in detail and the cities that are going to be in that land. Okay, now Judah was the first tribe to be selected. Why do you think Judah was the first tribe to be selected? I don't know this, but why do you think? Of the twelve sons of Israel, who was it that ended up receiving the firstborn's blessing? It wasn't Reuben, it wasn't Simeon, and it wasn't Levi. Who was it? It was Judah. Wasn't it? And so there's, I think, some significance here that Judah was placed first in here in receiving that land inheritance. Okay, Genesis 49 8 is when, is, is when Jacob was blessing his sons, and Judah was the one that ended up receiving the firstborn's blessing. And so when you read through these verses, in the first 12 verses, uh, we see that their land is defined. Now starting in verse 13, let's pick up reading in verse 13. According to the commandment of the Lord to Joshua, he gave to Caleb, the son of Jephthah, a portion among the people of Judah. Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, Arba was the father of Anak. And Caleb drove out from there three sons of Anak, Shishai and Aman and Talmai, the descendants of Anak. These are giants that we're talking about. Like Goliath, right? These big, big people. Caleb's driving these guys out. Okay, And he went up from there against the inhabitants of Deber. Now the name of Deber for formerly was Kiriath Sefer. And Caleb said, Whoever strikes Kiriath Sefer and captures it, to him I will give Asha, my daughter, as a wife. And Othniel, the son of Kenaz, the brother of Caleb, captured it. And he gave him Asha, his daughter, as wife. When she came to him, she urged him to ask her father for a field. And she got off her donkey, and Caleb said to her, What do you want? She said to him, Give me a blessing, since you have given me the land of Negeb. Give me also springs of water. And he gave her the upper springs and the lower springs. So, we see Caleb here fulfilling what he told Joshua he was going to do. He told Joshua... You give me the land that God had promised me, I'm going to drive these giants out. It doesn't matter. God's on my side, I'm going to do it. Chapter 15, the verses that we just read, is him fulfilling his word. Okay? And so we're introduced to this guy named Othniel. Who can tell me who Othniel is? We'll see him in Judges. He's going to become Israel's first judge. Okay? And so we'll see a little more about him here in just a little bit. Um, but he promises anyone who helps me conquer Deber, I'm going to give my daughter uh, as your wife. And so Othniel jumps at that chance, and he uh, does what Caleb asks, and Caleb fulfills his word as a man of faith would. And he gives them, I guess, the best description that I have seen, a wedding present. She said, we have this land, can you give us something else too? And he gives them those uh, waters that are described there. Now, starting there in verse 20, going through really the end of the chapter, verse 62, uh, the cities uh, that are going to be belonging to Judah there are listed. 
So it's the cities within that tribe um, that they will be able to inhabit. Um, now, what I want us to see before we stop this morning is the very last verse of chapter 15. But the Jebusites, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the people of Judah could not drive out. So the Jebusites dwell with the people of Judah at Jerusalem to this day. Let me ask you a question. Why was Judah not able to drive out the inhabitants of Jerusalem? I don't know the details. Here's what I do know though. The only way they could not drive these people out is they did not fulfill what God has asked them to do. They broke faith with God somehow. I don't know the details. But I know that it wasn't a lack of God, is it? If they would have done what God had asked, they would have been able to drive out the Jebusites from Jerusalem. Now we'll see the Jebusites ended up getting driven out from Jerusalem by who? David. David had to conquer Jerusalem later on. <laughs> had to give David something to do. Okay, that'll work, yeah. But David ruled from Hebron, which we just read about for his first few years, didn't he? And he ended up having to drive the Jebusites out of Jerusalem, and Jerusalem would then become the, the capital city where the king of Israel would rule. But here in this case, Judah did They could not drive out Israel. Why? Something happened. I don't know what it was. There, there might be an account of it somewhere, and I just don't know. I don't know. But they could not drive out the Jebusites. What do I automatically know? They broke faith with God. Somehow. Okay? Because if they had not, they would have been able to conquer, as Caleb did, anything. Giants, a mountain, it doesn't matter. God is on your side, you can do it. Okay? Alright. Any thoughts or comments on that? We're going to stop there, and we're going to pick up in chapter 16. How far are you wanting to go? 16 through? Alright, 16 through 21. Five chapters. Read them, okay? Okay. We just had VBS. Last week we had a great opportunity to be able to invite people to this wonderful event that we had. And so thank you to everyone that put that word out. Uh, I think it was a success. I know we had a lot of visitors, so that's good. Now, during VBS, who was able to talk to other people about the Lord and invite them to come worship and study with us? Raise your hand. Okay. All right, so a couple weeks ago, I had, we had about 30 people's hands go up. We need to get back to that and improve, okay? Um, so let's do everything that we can to look there are opportunities every single day. And I know that because I have opportunities every single day. And I'll also be the first to admit, I cower at those responsibilities sometimes. I have gotten better, but I still have a long way to go. Okay, We need to look for every, advance, every opportunity that we have to talk to people about God and invite them to come study with us. Okay, So I encourage all of us, please take every opportunity that you have to spread that gospel to just one more. One more soul, okay? All right, thank you. Seminar, yes. How did I? How could I forget? Invite people to the seminar, okay? What a wonderful opportunity, especially other Christians. We need to invite other Christians to learn more about how to evangelize, okay? And so that will be Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday night starting. Supper's at 5.30. Supper's at 5.30. Man, we're... Our grocery bill has gone down. We ate every night here last week. We're going to eat three nights here this week. So uh, Take that opportunity, okay? It's going to be a wonderful... Rob Whitaker is fantastic. He will get us on fire. I can promise you that. All right, thank you. 